Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll hear from two members of a new team charged with overseeing investigations into thousands of uninvestigated child abuse cases. And we'll speak with the author of a travel book about a most unusual destination, Death Valley. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Democratic State Senator Leah Landrum Taylor made it official today. She is running for Secretary of State. Landrum Taylor has been in the state legislature for 15 years and until recently served as Senate Minority Leader. Landrum Taylor says she's running for Secretary of State to, quote, make sure Arizona's electoral system is honest and trustworthy. Governor Brewer recently created a team to provide oversight for thousands of uninvestigated child abuse cases. The Child Advocate Response Examination Team will investigate CPS's actions and report to the governor by the end of January. Joining us now is CARE Team Chair Charles Flanagan, Director of the Arizona Department of Juvenile Corrections. Also joining us is CARE Team Member and State Representative Kate Brophy. McGee. Good to have you both here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Good to be here. All right, you. the CARE Team, what exactly is this team charged with doing? Uh, well, actually, that's a great question, um, and it has been confused in some people's minds because there are multiple things that are happening at the same time around this issue. But the CARE Team directive, uh, our charges from Governor Brewer are very simple. The first is that we are to oversee the investigations into the thousands of NI cases or not investigated cases. And the second part of that is to look at the system, the process, the personnel, and to determine what recommendations we can make to the governor so that something like this not investigated pro uh, problem can arise again. And so basically overseeing what other people are investigating, will the care team be investigating itself? I think the care team has a role as directed by the governor that's very clear. I view us as a crisis team in terms of looking at those, finding those missing children, putting boots on the ground to make sure that that gets done very quickly. And I think the members on the team are independent. We're all very child-centered and we are all focused on making sure those children are safe. In terms of uh, a strategy, how, how does the team oversee, let, let's start with these 65 or so hundred in uninvestigated cases, how are you doing this? Well, as of now, we have 6,554 cases that we've identified definitively as being in the pool of a case that was at one point or another identified as NI or not investigated. As the governor pointed out, this means that that case was pulled before it got to the managers and the caseworkers in the field. That means they never saw these. They didn't know that they were there. Um, so because it spans such a great period of time from 2009 forward, what we're doing is first verifying the information, and most people have a hard time understanding that. So uh, before we became involved, CPS began reviewing these cases and they put some information out. Uh, when we were impaneled by the governor, we wanted to make sure that the people reviewing those cases were people that were uninvolved in the NI process and making the decisions about them were involved in the process. So that took time. Secondly, we wanted to go over to make sure that the decisions that they made, the recommendations they made about these cases were appropriate ones. Now, because um, the database system from the Department of uh, Economic Security and uh, CPS is so large and so cumbersome, what we're trying to do is figure out which of these cases might have had a subsequent report in which the child was seen. Because the governor made it absolutely clear, and as Representative Brophy McGee said, our first priority is the safety of these children. We want to put eyes on these children. We want to know every child that's associated with all of these cases, and it will probably be more than the 6,554. And we want to make sure that they are safe. And then to pursue the investigation that's required by law, that CPS should be doing, and then subsequently to make those recommendations for change. And I want to get back to the logistics here in a second, but how does then does the care team differ from the DPS investigation, from CPS's investigation? Compare and contrast, please. I would say that the care team is focused, first of all, on the 6,500 cases. Another piece of it is restoring the public's trust in how these cases have been dealt with because the public trust in my perception was lost with the discovery of these cases. So it's important in going forward 
that we make sure that these cases are properly investigated and that eyes are laid on every single one of these children. My understanding of the DPS case is it's more of a forensic case, trying to understand how this happened in relation, and I think uh, Director Flanagan could explain that. As far as uh, the CPS self-investigation, I think that's an internal administrative review. So you are not necessarily sharing information with these other investigations? I wouldn't say that no. that's true. Um, if we discover something that we believe uh, DPS needs to know in the pursuit of their administrative investigation, then we will certainly do so. If we discover something that Director Carter needs to know as he pursues his administrative investigation, we'll provide it to them. And then we have the uh, Legislative Oversight uh, Committee, which is also looking at this problem. But there are, and, and I think Representative Brophy McGee did a great job of describing what those differences are, our primary focus per the governor, is the safety of these children. Our secondary is to ensure that we help to restore the trust in CPS. And she was very clear, the CPS caseworkers, the investigators that are at the line level providing these services, these are beleaguered, overworked, very, very caring people that are trying to do their best for these children. It has nothing to do with them, it has to do with the system. If you find a problem, if the team finds a problem or finds a particular case that is, is a double red flag here. Do you act immediately? What happens here? Or is this all just pooled in? I mean, I think a lot of people are concerned that there's a lot of investigation going on here, and maybe there are some kids that might still be at risk as everyone's, you know, investigating all sorts of things. What happens if you find something? I think that's an excellent question. And, and uh, from all of my experience in juvenile corrections, adult corrections, um, and my contact with law enforcement, you will treat each individual bit of information individually. So it depends on the circumstances. If we find things that need to be acted on immediately, we will act on them immediately, whether that be a referral to, uh, to another organization, to another law enforcement entity, and certainly by reporting it. And the governor has made it very clear, we are to be completely open and transparent. We are doing the best we can do in that arena without betraying the uh, identity of the children or the people involved in making the reports. So uh, just one, f one final point to make on this that I think is really critical is that we intend to present long-term potential solutions to the governor, but our primary focus now is getting out to see these children. And this would not have been discovered had it not been for the advocacy of Governor Brewer in creating legislative change to include the Office of Child Welfare uh, investigations and the support from the legislature to do that. And so we already have processes in place to make those referrals. The, uh, these, obviously the, these cases did not make it to the caseworkers. What can you tell us? Why did they not make it to caseworker desks? Well, I can tell you functionally how it happened, that there was an internal team of senior level investigator caseworkers who literally would go in and pull these cases off the line, so to speak, uh, and make a determination that no further investigation was warranted. What that speaks to me uh, as a policymaker is something in the system went terribly wrong. And I am really more focused in understanding what went wrong, um, how, how are the practices and procedures that are occurring at CPS or that occurred at CPS, how did this happen and what do we need to fix from a policy standpoint to make sure that it never happens again? Well, what are you learning? Why did these people think that that was an appropriate thing to do? I don't have an answer to that. I am certain that there is some type of rationalization uh, or rationalizations that occurred, but I, I can go all over the place and speculate what it might be. I want to know the results of the DPS investigation. It is so easy in an environment that is so highly charged with emotion as the situation is to jump to all kinds of conclusions. And I simply refuse to do that. Yeah, and I'm not looking for you to j jump to conclusions, but I think because this is an investigative team, an oversight team, people are saying, what are you learning? What are you hearing? Why did this happen? And if you haven't, five staffers, uh, CPS staffers have been fired now. 
Why? Yeah, placed on well, administrative leave. I yeah, think. well, First, uh, administrative uh, leave. Exactly. For most of us, we think of it as fire. But yes. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, they were placed on administrative leave by Director Carter because um, he determined that it was important for them to be away from the workplace while the administrative investigations were ongoing because of their involvement in this okay. case. They've not been found guilty of anything yet. Okay. There's been no uh, punishment or disciplinary issue that is still pending. Are you getting cooperation? from CPS, from everyone that you're looking at. Yes, I will tell you, first of all, I know the heart of Representative Kate Brophy McGee, Senator Leah Landrum Taylor, and our governor for children. And I know how much um, this makes uh, this issue a priority for them and how important it is to them and to me as well and the other members of this team. We're all basically people who are involved in the child welfare system at one uh, level or another. Um, the second thing is, yes, we've been receiving uh, assistance within the ability of uh, folks to work with us, and quite frankly, that's been mandated. The governor's office has been very, very helpful in getting us to get to the things we need to get to. There are people in uh, DES and uh, DCYF and uh, CPS that have been very helpful, and we've had a tremendous uh, outpouring of uh, support from people in the community, from legislators, from former judges. Um, because of my contact with the juvenile justice system, the judges, the court directors, Directors, they've all been reaching out to provide assistance to us, the administrative office of the court and, and individuals, foster parents. Um, we were both at the, um, the forum that was held. I was going to talk about that. Exactly. Yeah. We were both at the forum held in the community. And, uh, you know, I listened to every person who presented there. We're going to receive uh, all of the written comments that were made there. And I can tell you the people there, it was an incredibly positive experience. It, mm -hmm. and, yeah, and we actually we talked to some folks who, who helped uh, lead that particular mm -hmm. event. As far as what you've been finding so far, though, again, mm -hmm. people want... They don't want speculation, but they want to know that something has been found or something is being found. Are I, you finding things? I think, it, it, as I said, we're very beginning in the process, and my first priority is to find those children. But I will tell you, uh, from testimony, from communication, from constituents, and those types of stakeholders who work with the CPS system and its affiliates, I think what you're seeing is, or what I believe I'm seeing, is a breakdown, uh, a numerous breakdowns within the system so that decision making quit being uniform and went awry. Um, again, I would like to understand how that occurred or what the rationalization was, but when the system became overwhelmed with cases uh, and the rise in caseloads that occurred concurrent with the 2009-10 Great Recession, I, I think the system broke down. And that's why I am looking to separate the agency out from a far larger agency, because I think it needs more hands-on management. And when you look at DES as a whole, CPS being part of that, it's much too large of an agency for one single person to manage. It needs more attention and it needs more focus. And we have just that that just, uh, suggestion has occurred in conversations we've had previously as well. Um, the idea of, of 10,000 case backlog and 12,000 cases still not completed and these sorts of now we've got investigations coming here, there, and everywhere. Is is the work of protecting children, be that as it may, is it getting done during all of this? I think assurances are work is being done to make sure that it's, get, it's getting done at least to the extent that it has. One of my concerns prior to the discovery of these not investigated cases was the buildup of this backlog and its continuation. In a sense, it has become part of the system or part of the caseload. And one of the things that I'm looking for and talking to different people about is Assuming we can figure out the NI situation, how do we then and can we use that information to address the backlog, Last which is more significant? Quickly, please. Yeah, just to, to add uh, something to that, in, in my role in juvenile justice, what we found is that there has been throughout the nation a decline in juvenile delinquency, but there's been an explosion in juvenile um, dependency. And so I think part of this is that there has been this huge increase in the need. Uh, there are many, many unmet needs that are out there, and so the agency has been forced to do a lot. And I would also mention we have um, our website, 
uh, is up, and so we have been receiving information there. We are posting updates there, as m many as we can. It will eventually become faster as we make uh, more progress, and then we're about to start a 1-800 number so that people can contact us. And I'd also mention that members of the care team are me meeting with the different types of groups and organizations from court-appointed special advocates to the judicial system to the foster care try and to gain input and insights from them. Well, I, I, real quickly now, because we're running out of time, that leads to my last question. Critics say a one-time blue ribbon panel, can it really change anything? I, I think uh, the answer to that is we have a, a very small, uh, usually that's the case, window of opportunity here to affect change. So two things. One, we are working on trying to get eyes on every one of these children and assure their safety. And I'm confident that we will have a really good handle on that before the end of the two months. The second is we're looking at the system and the process and the people and the policies and the procedures and making recommendations for change. And if people understand the magnitude of this issue, and we have advocates uh, in the legislature and in the community to help uh, give the um, or empower uh, the legislature and the executive to make these changes, yes, I think we can make changes that are long-term. All right. It's good to have you both here. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining us. Thank you for the opportunity. Travel writer Roger Naylor has a new book. Naylor's latest work is Death Valley, Hottest Place on Earth. It's a guidebook filled with history, humor, and spectacular photographs. Roger Naylor is here to discuss his new book. It's good to have you here. Congratulations on the book. Thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, this, yeah. this is the, the, it's, it's a beautiful production here. I mean, it is. In this day of e-books and iBooks and all sorts of books, uh, this is a good old-fashioned book. I'm an old-fashioned kind of guy. I like to hold a book in my hand. I like to see the photos. I like to, that weight and significance of it. Yeah, I, I, heard, I know you've described yourself as a travel writer who hates to travel. I do. I Explain don't, here. I don't budge. I, uh, I, I'm very fortunate. I, I live in Arizona and that's 95 percent of what I write is just Arizona. And then the rest of it is just our neighbors, the Southwest. I don't go beyond the Southwest. So I write all these travel stories for magazines and newspapers, but I'm just writing about my backyard. So, so it's very cool. Why did you include Death Valley in your backyard? Uh, I'm a desert guy. I, I love the desert, which is not a lifestyle that I recommend. Uh, loving the desert is like being in a relationship with someone who constantly tries to kill you. <laughs> Yet you always forgive them. You know, it's just. But it, uh, I'm just drawn to it. And if if you have a passion for that starkness, for that uh, that desert. Uh, you're drawn to Death Valley. It's the biggest and baddest of the of all of them. And I was going to say, I mean, in terms of austerity, I mean, it's just it's that's that's it. I mean, I can't think of a place yeah. where things just seem so 
separate and alone and quiet. It is. It is the quietest place I've ever been in my life. And I spend a lot of time in the back country. I'm in a lot of distant places, so I'm accustomed to that, but I have never heard a silence like in Death Valley. It's not even just an absence of sound. It's like a debunking of sound. It's like sound doesn't even exist. And it took me a while to think about that And uh, because a lot of times you're in places where there are no leaves to rustle, there are no lizards scurrying, there are no birds flying, no little wings. There is nothing, no insects. Yeah. It is just, it, it's it's eerie, but it's stunning. It, it, just, it o just overwhelms you. When you decided to write the book, what did you expect to find when you went there? And what did you find? I went for the desert. I, I, I'm drawn to that. I was uh, astonished by the diversity of it because uh, the desert is massive, but then you also have these uh, beautiful slot canyons, these soaring mountains, uh, beautiful meadows, uh, uh, sand dunes, uh, old ghost towns, uh, uh, beautiful uh, wetlands, uh, waterfall. I, you know, I just found it all, and it's just a uh, amazing once you start rambling around and exploring and seeing all this is here. Death Valley is the largest national park in the lower 48 states. It's 3.4 million acres. It's the size of Connecticut. So it's it's a big old place. When you were rambling around in this big old place, did you go all seasons of the year and that includes summer? I went, the first time I went was the summer. As soon as I signed the contract for the book, I went middle of July. See, you can't write a book about Death Valley no. if you're not going to be there no. at its peak. And and I was there middle of July, and I'm doing a little hiking, which you know is pretty. You know, I'm thinking it's it's pretty hardcore and stuff. So I was there while they were doing the uh, most grueling foot race on the planet. It's the Badwater Ultra Marathon, where they start the lowest point in the lower 48 states run to the highest, 135 miles, cross Death Valley, middle of July. So, you know, I'm thinking I'm, I'm pretty tough because I'm hiking three or yeah. four miles, and you know, I'm, and then I meet these people, these ultra marathoners, yeah. and, and next to them I'm like Jabba the Hutt. You know, <laughs> these are some mean, and athletic people and stuff. But. I think tough would be one word to describe them. <laughs> yeah. we, there are other uh, words we could use. Um, did you see much sign of human inhabitants? Yeah, uh, scattered here and there, there's beautiful ghost towns. For people who, who like that sort of thing, who are into ghost towns, there's, uh, in different places, Death Valley has such an amazing history of, uh, of mining activity, and uh, around in the desert, things endure, things mm -hmm. last. They get very weathered and, and uh, worn, but there's just some spectacular ghost towns. And, you know, even some of the ones where the remains are even small, you know, you still... I like doing that discovery. I like finding old foundations. And then, and then when you come out, like uh, one of the Leadfield is in Titus Canyon, you're driving through this windy, twisty canyon out in the middle of nowhere, and there's this little, a few little buildings still perched on the hillside. Isn't that something? Oh, man, that's just so nice. Did, uh, as far as the photographs, and it just, uh, it's not a picture book, but all oh, the photographs are yeah. really special. Yeah. Did you take these? Did you work with someone who took I, I wish I did know. Uh, I, there are multiple photographers that uh, 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 snap photos. Uh, my brother-in-law has a whole bunch of photos in there, and then some other terrific uh, professional photographers. And uh, yeah, it, it it really that's one of the things I wanted to do uh, is make sure that the the photos just jump off the page because and you need that size. That's one of the things I liked about yes. the the large size of the book because you want to see that immensity. You want to see that color and. Uh, and that's what Death Valley is all about. It's all about color and texture. I've never been to a place where everything's exposed. And at first glance, you think, oh, there's not much here. And then you start watching the light change and the textures change, and it really mesmerizes you. I, I thought one of the quotes was interesting. Uh, Death Valley has all the advantages of hell without the inconveniences. <laughs> yeah, that was from one of the old newspapers and stuff <laughs> back, like, in, back in the day. Did you yeah. find that to be the case? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It, it, it is still... Uh, I like the fact that it's still wilderness, that it's still, you're still so far removed. Uh, uh, cell phones don't work uh, for the most part other than just in, you know, one little area or two. Uh, your GPS is very unreliable. Uh, they, they warn you not to depend on that because there are so many old mining roads it can take you on and it gets people in trouble. So you're kind of out on your own. And again, I'm an old fashioned guy. I like you know, that experience. I like being able to 
not being able to yeah. punch up something on the phone and figure out what this is. I've, I've got to solve it myself. I've got to get to it and figure out what it is. Yeah. I like that. I would imagine at night you can find the North Star pretty doggone oh, easily. Oh, yeah. The, these the stars, stars are pretty uh, stunning. And if you are there during a full moon, to see the full moon rise over the, uh, the salt flats uh. is uh, something you just don't forget. Last question. This is Death Valley. Your previous book was uh, Route 66. Just the Arizona portion. Your Arizona kicks on Route 66. So Again, what's next? I, uh, I'm, I'm working on a third book. It's an Arizona on a hiking and dining guide called Boots and Burgers. Boots and Burgers. Because that's my favorite day. You hike a trail, you go eat a great <laughs> hamburger. Tell well, me I don't have a great job. I, I, I was going to say, <laughs> congratulations on a variety of fronts, but especially on a very nice book. Thank you. Thank you. Tomorrow on Arizona Horizon, physicist Lawrence Krauss joins us for his monthly look at the latest science news, including a postmortem on a comet that recently grazed the sun. That's Tuesday evening, 5, 30, and 10, right here on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.